who had the most extraordinary teenage years of anybody I've ever heard of. He was called a child prodigy. He's the inventor of the Neurophone, which he invented at about the age of 13, applied for a patent for it. And it took him several years to get that patent because everybody in the government says, we can't let that get patented, it won't work. Well, he finally flew to Washington and he tested the Neurophone with a profoundly deaf employee there. And the deaf employee for the first time was able to hear opera, tears in his eyes, and it was just incredible. So of course they gave him the patent finally. Then in 1972, he released the book Pyramid Power, one of the most famous books on these kind of subjects ever. Now he lives in Santa Cruz. He's still inventing, still rolling, just an amazing person. Uh, his latest invention was Mega H, the world's most powerful antioxidant. He has a website, www.phisciences.com, Phi Sciences. So phisciences.com. And let's welcome Patrick Flanagan. All right. Oops. The microphone is supposed to stay at the base of my throat. There we go. And. Uh, and I woke up this morning with a frog in my throat. It's still crawling around in there. So, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I won't need that. No oh, good. I can walk around, that's right, I'm wireless. Well, thank you for getting up and coming here early this morning. I know. I had a tough time <laughs> coming here early this morning. Um, I'm the kind of person that works late at night from midnight to six in the morning. And uh, I usually go to bed at six in the morning instead of getting up at six in the morning. Um, all right. So. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got started because it's uh, a significant part of the Neurophone story. And um, when I was um, eight years old, I had a uh, series of dreams that made me want to learn everything I could learn. Um, uh, nightmares, we call them nightmares. And, uh, and these dreams were uh, the color and, and the detail was so intense that it was um, more real than, than what we call real life. And the result of that dream, in the dream I was an adult flying an airplane over the Pacific Ocean, a single engine airplane, and the engine started sputtering and cutting out and I saw an island in the distance small island with a big white sandy beach and a few palm trees. And so I landed the airplane on the island in the dream. And uh, it was near sunset. And I didn't have a flashlight to look under the cowling to see what was wrong with the motor. So I had to wait till the following morning till light came. So I was sitting on the beach contemplating my situation when I saw a light coming from a distance toward the island and I thought it was another airplane. So I was getting all excited about it and it got closer and closer. And as the light got closer, it became a UFO, a flying saucer. And uh, kind of like what uh, they call Pleiadian beam ship, uh, if you've seen those in Billy Myers' uh, pictures. And the UFO landed right on the beach and a doorway opened up and a stairway came down and some people got out, and uh, this dream was in 1952, <clears throat> before we had laptop computers and things like that, but these people carried with them what looked like a laptop computer and a small portable table, and they put the table on the beach, opened up the computer, 
started working on it, and then they had a, a, um, what looked like a motorcycle helmet, only the inside of this motorcycle helmet, <coughs> excuse me, was covered with small electrodes, um, metal pieces that looked like uh, silver quarters all over the inside of it. And they put this helmet on my head and they started fiddling with their computer. And I said, uh, ask them, what are you doing? And they said, we're measuring your knowledge and your intelligence. And I said, why? They said, well, we're using you an example of an average earthling and if you don't match our minimum requirements, we're going to destroy you and all people on earth, and then the dream would end. And uh, when they... <laughs> and when they said that, uh, of course, they were very menacing. And um, so the dream came every single night, and I got to where I didn't want to go to sleep, go to bed, because the dream was always waiting for me. And um, so... The only thing that made the dream go away was to read everything I could get my hands on and to learn everything I could learn. And when I got lazy and went out and uh, played like other kids, the dream would come back. And so it kind of made, kept me in check. And I began learning. And by the time I was 14 years old, I was um, measured uh, at 14,500 words a minute with 95% uh, comprehension. Uh, and I was devouring about 10 or 12 books a day uh, at that rate uh, during my teenage years. And I became very interested uh, in several subjects during this time. And uh, one of them was chemistry. The other was uh, physics, electronics, and abnormal psychology. My mother kept telling me to be normal like other kids, and I was trying to figure out what normal was. And I, I knew I was abnormal, so I was trying to figure myself out by reading all these psychology books. I didn't ever figure it out. But uh, <laughs> the result was, um, was that when, when I was 11, I read this, um, this book by, Ralph Gern, uh, by Hugo Gernsback. Hugo Gernsback was the founder of Gernsback Publications in New York, which is a technical publishing company. Uh, he published a lot of uh, magazines back in those days. He published actually back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, he published, um, I think, Radio uh, Electronic Experimenter and a number of other electronic technical magazines and books. And it turns out that Hugo Gernsback was a science fiction writer. And so he wrote this book. Um, the title of it was Ralph 124C41+. That was the, the first, the hero's first name was Ralph. And his last name was a series of numbers and letters. And the last name was the number 1, 2, 4, the letter C, and then 4, and then 1 with a plus after it. And um, the hero was, uh, again, this book was written in 1911. And the hero was a Nikola Tesla kind of character. He, he had all kinds of magnifying transmitters and high voltage equipment. And um, in this book, Gernsback predicted many, many things that hadn't been created yet. He predicted intercontinental ballistic missiles, radar, television, um, all kinds of, of advanced um, equipment, which I'll, I'll describe in a moment. And he also even uh, told about a park in New York City. And when he wrote the book, a park did not exist at that address in New York. And, but later on, like uh, 40 years later, they actually made a park in that, at that address in New York. So he, his predictions were amazingly accurate. And one of the devices that the hero had was this electronic device where he could put um, these transducers on his head and he could plug this device into a, a learning machine and he could, he could learn any subject while he slept at night 
or uh, it would uh, tune in to the news from all around the world by radio and uh, all the world news would be transmitted into his brain while he slept. And um, I thought that was an incredible idea because that would mean that you could also learn in your sleep. Because I tried learning in my sleep. I, I got a pillow speaker. Way back then they had wire recorders. We didn't even have tape recorders back then. We had wire recorders. Uh, there, you had a, a, a reel of, uh, of um, wire, a nickel ferromagnet, uh, ferromagnetic nickel combination of wire, and, and they recorded on that. So I would take a wire recorder, record information on it, put a pillow speaker under my pillow, and I tried to, to have that teach me while I slept so I could learn 24 hours a day, and that didn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because the human brain uh, has selective hearing. And for example, a, a young mother could live in an apartment in downtown Chicago and uh, traffic going by, uh, horns hawking, sirens, things like that, wouldn't even wake her up. But if she heard her baby cry, just the slightest whimper from her baby and she'd be awake and uh, attending the child because our brain has the ability to selectively filter audio and uh, much to the consternation of, of uh, some of our friends, for example, uh, we've all experienced uh, that filter. You can focus on your attention on something <coughs> so intently that when someone talks to you, you don't hear what they're saying. And um, so I thought, boy, if I had one of these machines, I could transmit knowledge into my brain while I slept, and, uh, and that would really help out. So I began experimenting and researching. Now, at the, at the age of eight, I had become a ham radio operator and got my general license, general class license at eight, and I built all of my own equipment uh, using vacuum tubes I designed and built the vacuum tube transmitters and receivers and, and so forth. And even uh, way back then had made um, uh, Tesla coils that operated at 14 megahertz, um, extremely high frequency, very, very high voltage. And I used to feed, feed that high voltage and modulate it, audio modulate it into antennas and uh, communicate it all over the world with really uh, excellent results, and, uh, except for the neighbors. The, uh, <laughs> I had neighbors complaining. I had neighbors two blocks down the street who would get up in the morning and they'd go to brush their teeth and they'd get an arc off, their, uh, <laughs> off the faucet to their mouth. <laughs> and uh, alarm clocks would go off all over the neighborhood when I turned my transmitter on. Now, I'm talking about mechanical alarm clocks, not, not electronic ones. And um, so I was quite a little terror when I was a kid. And, um, but anyway, I began researching, and now here's the weird part. Well, my whole life is weird, so, but <laughs> here's a weird part. Um, I earned my money to, to make all of my equipment when uh, being a television repairman uh, after school, and one of, one of the, my associates uh, by the name of Lou, who, who worked, Lou Macko in Houston, Texas, was interested in UFOs, and he had been reading all these uh, UFO books and things, and, and there was a big convention at a giant rock out in California uh, with the big dome, and uh, um, so Lou went out to California to this UFO convention, and when he got back, he, he brought me this information, and he said, uh, Patrick, a weird thing happened at the UFO convention. And I said, what's that? And he said, this guy came up to me, and he, and he didn't look, he looked otherworldly. He didn't look really human. But he came up, and he said, I have a circuit. I want you to give Patrick Flanagan. And Lou said, oh. <laughs> and he said, yes, and here it is. And, and what, what he gave Lou is he told Lou, that if I took a vacuum tube audio output transformer and I reversed it. Now, vacuum tube audio transformer, va amplifiers back then worked at about 350 volts. Uh, and uh, 
So the audio transformers would reduce the, the 350 volt uh, signal, audio signal down to eight ohms to power loudspeakers. And so uh, these transformers had a pretty good turns ratio. And so what, what he said I should do is take an audio vacuum tube audio output transformer and reverse it so that I got high voltage coming out, high voltage audio coming out on the uh, outside of this thing, and then uh, take small Brillo pads. Brillo pads are those little mesh pads that you clean dishes with, uh, chore girl Brillo pads. And I was to put a plastic baggie around each pad, connect it to the output of this transformer, and put that on my head. And I would be able to hear the audio that way through through these um, things, and so so Lou brought this drawing back for me, and so uh, he said I wouldn't try it because boy you could fry your brain with that, and put out three thousand volts you know, and uh, uh, at peak to peak. Anyway, so I built one of these little things and I put it on my head, and sure enough I could hear audio. It was extremely distorted uh, with moments in, in audio peaks where it was extremely clear. And so I was trying to figure out how come it was distorted most of the time and how come at certain moments the audio got crystal clear. And so uh, I looked at it with an oscilloscope and I saw that it was ringing at 40 kilohertz. And, and that when, when it would ring, when it was overdriven, when the audio app was overdriven, and, and it would ring uh, at 40 kilohertz, that's when the signal would sound really clear. So I got this idea. I built a uh, 40 kilohertz amplitude variable uh, frequency, amplitude modulator around 40 kilohertz. And um, it put out 3,000 volts peak to peak. And, um, and I hooked the thing up, put it on my head, and, uh, and then I tuned it to resonance. And when you tuned it right to resonance, uh, the resonance would change depending on the pressure of the electrodes on my head. Uh, but when I got, got the best resonance and the highest voltage, I had this beautiful audio in my head. So then I built a self-tuning audio oscillator that, um, that was able to um, follow the, the changes in capacitance of the electrodes so that it was in tune all the time. And that was my first neurophone. And it was crystal clear, it sounded wonderful, it was really loud. And uh, so I immediately started using it for sleep learning and it worked. I could, I could learn it and I, it seemed to bypass the filters, the brain filters, so that I could actually learn. So I was learning at night as well as during the day. And, um, so I showed it around to a few friends, and then someone said, well, why don't you bring it to the Houston Amateur Radio Club meeting and demonstrate it to all the radio amateurs. So I took it down to the Houston Amateur Radio Club. We had about 500 people there, and um, I think <laughs> some cell phone is going off, isn't it? Um, took it down to the Houston Amateur Radio Club, and demonstrated it. And the weird thing was, is that there were people in, in the back of the room, quite a ways back, who were able to hear the signal on the neurophone when people up front couldn't hear it. Uh, but the person wearing the neurophone could hear it. So there was uh, some kind of telepathic or stimulated telepathic transmission going on. And so the result is that we, um, um, uh, shortly after my meeting, a reporter from the Houston Post, who was also a ham radio operator, came to me and he said that he had a, a granddaughter who was profoundly deaf from spinal meningitis, about four years old, and would I try the neurophone on her to see if maybe she might respond to it. So he brought her to the house and we tried the neurophone out and sure enough, uh, she was able to it seemed like she was able to hear with it because she started bouncing to the music like she was responding to it and she had a big, big smile on her face from it. 
And uh, so he was all excited. He wrote an article, and the next day it was on the front page of the Houston Post, and the day following it was on the front page of 300 newspapers throughout the United States. And that was sort of uh, the beginning of publicity on the neurophone. Well, I have to back up a little bit because I invented the first ultrasonic neurophone at 13. But when I was 11, I was um, uh, in school and, uh, and the big Houston science fair was coming and they said, well, students uh, should enter science fair projects. And since I had a, since I was a ham radio operator, they suggested, the teachers suggested I enter the science fair. So I had this idea, well, <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I did some weird thing with my throat. Okay, I had this idea. Um, I had read about, um, back in those days, there were lots of publications on atomic bombs and, and uh, uh, what happened when an atomic bomb went off and, and the, the kind of, of hot gases that, that would rise as a result of, of the explosion. And also, um, there were articles on ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I read that, that, that both ICBMs and atomic bombs created superheated gas plasmas uh, when they went off. And uh, so if, if you have a superheated gas plasma from a missile, like, a, like the shuttle taking off, for example, when, whenever the, the shuttle takes off, it creates a column of superheated atmospheric gas plasma that's miles high. And so what you have is you have a, a vertical antenna, a, a heated column of gas that acts like a superheated, highly conductive vertical antenna miles high. And that gas is a, uh, is a superheated plasma. And so it's generating, plasmas generate radio waves and because there are electrons being stripped off of atoms at very high rates of speed and there's all kinds of interactions between those particles uh, generating uh, radio waves and then they, the vertical antenna which is the column of gas uh, acts like a, uh, a vertical antenna and it radiates radio waves, ELF radio waves around the world and at certain low ELF frequencies uh, those signals will go around the world with, with less than a 3% decrease in intensity. So they'll travel completely around the world. And uh, this same thing happens with an atomic bomb. So I got the idea of building a special ELF radio receiver uh, that would detect these superheated plasmas. And, um, and I built one. And the result was that I, uh, I was able to track uh, missile launches and atomic tests, above ground atomic tests. And I was able to write down when, because I monitored this thing all the time, and, and I found out that an atomic bomb sounded one way and, uh, and the um, missile launching had a different sound to it, a, diff a different kind of modulation. And so I was able to determine not only when tests were being made, but the direction of the tests and able to figure out about where, where the test was done. And, um, so I had a list of all these tests done by the U.S. government. Uh, and anyway, I, I ended up winning the entire science fair, including winning over um, uh, uh, high school students. And um, the result was that, uh, uh, so I won the, the first, first place in the entire science fair, went back to school the following week, and was in study hall and their principal came on the uh, loudspeaker and he said, will Patrick Flanagan come to my office? The Pentagon is on the telephone. <laughs> and so I went down to the principal's office and uh, sure enough, there was a five-star general on the telephone and he wanted to know how I knew all these secrets about, <laughs> about their testing. And I told him I did it with my missile detector. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that got his attention. 
So they sent a, a team of scientists from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base down to Houston, and they examined my, my device. The funny thing is that I have the, the article on my computer uh, from the Houston Post, and, and it said, Patrick built his missile detector for $5. And, uh, <laughs> and it said, uh, if he had $20, he could build a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, anyway, <laughs> so that got the government, now I had their attention, and unfortunately. So when I, when I applied for the patent on the Neurofone, uh, first of all, they started giving me all kinds of problems and um, telling me that uh, no one had ever invented something like this before and therefore since no one had ever invented it, it couldn't possibly work. Of course, I was under the impression that an invention is supposed to be something that no one else has, but <laughs> apparently there's supposed to be improvements on other people's ideas uh, rather than original ideas. And so I went through my teenage years fighting, uh, fighting the uh, Pentagon and, I mean, and the patent office on this. And then when I was 17, I, I got a, um, I was offered to, uh, to receive an award called the Gold Plate Award. And it was at this very esoteric meeting in San Diego. And um, there were a number of scientists and people receiving this award. And it was supposed to be an honor to receive this award. So I went out to San Diego and um, and I was sitting at this award table and found myself, and, and sitting on, on one side of me was Admiral Red Rayburn, who was director in charge of the CIA. Sitting on my left side was Edward Teller, inventor of the hydrogen bomb, and over here was uh, Murray Gell-Mann, another Nobel Prize winning physicist, and so forth. And, so, so, and we were all receiving the this, this same award together, and it was, and, and they had U.S. Navy honor guards, and, and we got tours of the uh, U.S. Navy electronics facilities in San Diego and all of these various uh, things. And, um, and at the, um, the president of Bell & Howell was there. His, his name was Pete Peterson at the time. Uh, he was president of Bell & Howell. But the, the end result was Bell & Howell was a Pentagon. They, they did a lot of, uh, you know, government research. And so at the end of this thing, after we got our award, uh, Red Rayburn turned to me and he said, son, I like you a lot and I'd like to make you an offer. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, he said, I'd like you to go to any university in the world you wanna go to. And he said, you choose it, any, any university, just choose it. And don't worry about getting in, we'll get you in. And he said, uh, you learn everything you wanna learn study all you want to study, and when you've decided you've learned enough and you, gra you have all the degrees you want and graduate, then um, we'd like you to work for us at the CIA for about five years under contract, and then after that we'll let you go and do what you want to do. And uh, so I thought about this, and I was 17, and five years was one third of my life. At 17, five years is a long time. And uh, I thought, boy, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't work for anybody for five years. That's a third of my life. Um, About what year was that? Um, that was, let's see, 61. Thank you. Yeah. And so, uh, so anyway, so I said, well, I really can't do that. And, but Rayburn said, well, I'll tell you what, son, if you ever have any problems with government, he said, you just call the, Pentag the CIA and you leave a message for me and I'll call you back in 24 hours and I'll help you out no matter what, what your problems are. And because uh, I like you and, and in return, I'd like to tap your mind once in a while. If I have problems or things, maybe I could come to you and run the problems by you and maybe you could, you know, get some ideas. So I said, okay, that sounds like a good deal. So he and I became friends, and, and over the years, he, he then shifted from the CIA to the National Security Agency, and which is a, a, well, I've heard of them, haven't we? 
they're bigger and broader and more in scope uh, than the CIA. But anyway, as, uh, as I, uh, in summers, I used to work for a Pentagon think tank called um, Hike Corporation, H-U-Y-C-K in Stanford, Connecticut. And the head of that uh, organization was uh, William O. Davis, who had been former head of the Office of Scientific Research of the Pentagon. And they were doing all kinds of really unusual, weird things uh, over there. And they were investigating my neurophone. And at the time, I had met Dr. Uh, Henri Coanda, who was working there, who is the father of fluid dynamics. And um, so I, and I had also consulted for Aberdeen Proving Grounds and, and had actually built a neurophone for uh, Vietnam. Uh, they had problems with people going through tunnels uh, in Vietnam if they wore headphones. Um, and the headphones uh, made the slightest noise for communications with the surface. And if a person was down in a tunnel with Viet Cong in one of these, and, and the headphones squeaked or squawked or something, then they were dead. And so what they wanted is a silent communication device. And the, the original neurophone with the high voltage and uh, the, the electrodes, by the way, turned out to be flat capacitor plates with uh, a thin film of mylar over the surface. And uh, uh, so, that, so that you had, uh, the, the mylar was the insulation to keep the 3,000 volts from uh, frying your, your uh, skin. And once in a while, we'd get a little pinprick in the insulation, and you'd get an RF burn on your head, and they were pretty severe. We didn't uh, enjoy them very much. And, um, but um, anyway, those neurophones were extremely silent uh, and, and fairly loud. And so I had built one for the Pentagon uh, for Aberdeen Proving Ground for Vietnam, which was uh, quite successful. So as we're moving along, uh, I began working for, uh, on, for the U.S. Navy on a project, a manned dolphin communications project in which we developed a translator that translated human speech into dolphin whistles, dolphin whistles back into human speech again, and we were developing a mutual vocabulary, and we had uh, offices in Boston, and, um, and uh, our dolphins were in Hawaii, and uh, off of uh, Oahu on Coconut Island, a small island, where we had a, uh, our, kept our dolphins and, and where we trained the dolphins. And um, during this period of time, I, I, we, we learn how human hearing works in three dimensions. How, for example, the pinna, which is the outer ear, encodes sound three-dimensionally. Uh, and it's a time ratio encoding in which these little ridges on the ear, uh, depending on, on which angle sound is coming from, actually uh, create little echoes that are picked up by the brain, and we can actually locate with our eyes closed sound anywhere in 3D space using these outer ears. And so one of the things we did is, is we, we made molds of the, uh, of the pinna of various people's outer ears, put microphones where the eardrum would be, and then mounted these ears on a, on a tripod and recorded sound with it. And then at Tufts University, we took 400 students, and we used the students to locate. They'd, we'd uh, jiggle keys at different locations in 3D space, make a recording, and then have students point to where they think the sound's coming from, anywhere around their head while listening to the sound through earphones. And we were able to show that, um, that any human being could use any other human being's ears to locate sound in space within a five degree accuracy. And, and so this was the first three dimensional sound encoding device uh, ever made. And, um, <clears throat> and the, the other thing is that it didn't matter how big the, the pinna was, the outer ear. It could actually be uh, extremely large and, and as long as it had the ridges in the right places, you could locate sound anywhere in 3D space. So we actually made these ears for, uh, as a test for some uh, soldiers in Vietnam where they had plastic ears that were about a foot in diameter that would go over their regular ears, and, and it would collect sound so well 
that uh, sounds in the jungle, if they heard a sound, they could hear way, way off, and they could locate its exact location, and it was kind of a survival tool. And uh, it was a great idea. It didn't really, uh, I guess it really didn't uh, get used very much, but uh, it, was, it really worked. Um, we also uh, built these things underwater. We took the human ear, we scaled it up five times, made it out of stainless steel, put hydrophones where the ear, eardrum would be, <clears throat> and, then, and then we, um, we made the device five times the size of a human head and put these ears underwater, and we recorded whales and dolphins, and sound travels five times as fast underwater as it does in the air. So the encoding turned out to be the same because of the five speed, five time increase in sound so that we could put a hydrophone underwater with these human ears on it and listen with the earphones and we could locate which whale was saying what, which dolphin was saying what, and so forth in any direction, locate any sound underwater in three dimensional space underwater um, using that, and that was quite effective. But the reason I'm, I'm describing this is that we discovered that the human brain uh, uses time ratio encoding, time ratios in order to uh, recognize speech and or also recognize position of sound in 3D space. And so I got this idea of building a time ratio encoded neurophone. And so um, I built a transistorized version of it and it worked extremely well and applied for a patent on it. Well, by this time, um, I had flown to, to Washington and, and gotten the first patent on the first neurophone after many, many years by demonstrating it, as described earlier, on a deaf employee of the patent office. And so when I applied for the second neurophone with the um, time ratio encoding modulation, the um, uh, patent office put it under secrecy. And so they said that it had use in defense and that I could no longer talk about it and that the penalty for, um, for uh, revealing data on my invention uh, was treason and the penalty was death by firing squad. And, uh, and I thought, great, the government will buy my invention and you know, that's fine. So the thing is, they said they couldn't pay me for it because I had, it wasn't on the market and, and we had no value for it. Therefore, they couldn't determine what value it was in, and they didn't have to pay me for it. And I said, well, if it was on the market, you couldn't put it under secrecy. And they said, that's right, but you didn't have it on the market. So anyway, <laughs> one of those deals. So. So I, I called up Red Rayburn, I called up the CIA, even though he was at NSA, I always reached him through the CIA. I called him up and I left a message and they said, the CIA said, we never heard of Red Rayburn. And I said, well, he was former director. And they said, still never heard of him. And I said, well, he told me to call and leave a message and he called me back in 24 hours. And they said, well, we'll take a message for someone named Red Rayburn and I don't guarantee someone that name, by that name will receive the message, but if someone by that name does receive it and they call you back, that's up to them. <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So I left my number and he called me back 24 hours later and he said, I, said, uh, I told him, I said, I want to get this thing out of secrecy. This is ridiculous. And, and he said, well, you do me a favor and, and I'll see what I can do. And I said, well, what favor do you want? And he said, we're having a hard time um, making uh, uh, secure voice transmissions on, uh, between our various facilities uh, because uh, every, everything we come up with, it can be decoded and can you figure out uh, a uh, way of encoding our, our voice communications so that no one can decode it? I said, yeah, I have a couple of ideas. And one of them is, is that uh, during our work, we had received a, a tape actually recorded in a, in a um, Russian embassy. Some U.S. had somehow planted a microphone in a room in a Russian embassy, and, uh, and they wanted us to see if we could make it so that it was intelligible. 
And all, most embassies in the world, I don't know if they still do, but they have something called hard rooms. And a hard room is, is a room made out of wood that has certain dimensions. And, and if you go in this room and you hold a conversation, it's got so many echoes uh, that if there's a microphone hidden somewhere, all the echoes pile up on top of each other and scramble the speech so that it's unintelligible. And, and yet, the human ear, because we have such abilities, uh, something called the cocktail party effect, the ability to localize sound in space and use attention and intention to, to listen, we can listen to each other in such a room, but microphones can't, can't record the sound intelligibly. And so my idea was that I would make a time ratio encoded uh, speech scrambler that was based on that using a series of electronic delay lines which would add multiple delays and, and, uh, and multiple uh, phases so that uh, any speech would be encoded. And since I knew the time delays I had inserted, we could subtract those time delays out on the other end. A pretty, pretty simple idea. So I built one of these and they tested it out and, and no one could decode it even after six months. And, and they have people who can decode speech scrambles in, in three days, the, the most complex, but they couldn't decode the one I made. And so as a result, Red Rayburn got my patent out of secrecy. And um, so, but very interesting thing happened. I'm bouncing around a little bit, but I'm really giving you the most precise history of the neurophone I've ever given in any lecture at any time. And um, when I was 17 years old, I was invited to lecture at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, uh, Minnesota. And, and there was an audience of about 500 doctors there. And I, I lectured about the neurophone and uh, about some of the things that I had learned with it and about the fact that it was uh, a learning aid and, and so forth. And I had also developed uh, some interesting skills um, from some of my studies. And um, during the lecture, I had um, two, two of the doctors who had played football at Notre, University of Notre Dame, and they were really big guys. And so I asked them to come up on the stage, and, and I held my arms like this, and I asked them, one on each side, and I said, see if you can pick me up. And they both picked me up real easy, like I was a feather. And then, um, then I said, okay, pick me up again. And then they couldn't pick me up. And they were straining and using all the power. And they couldn't pick me up because I was doing something mentally. And I explained to them that, that in one case, I just allowed them to pick me up. And in the other case, I actually mentally uh, visualized that I had a, a roots going down to the center of the earth, holding me in place, and that nothing could move me. And, uh, and they couldn't pick me up. And so one of those doctors was Dr. Steve Farian, who uh, brought Swami Rama over from the Himalayas. Swami Rama is a very famous, one of the first uh, mystics to be brought over from, from uh, the Himalayas and studied in a biofeedback laboratory. And Dr. Steve Farian was the guy who brought uh, Swami Rama over and tested him. And he had this extensive biofeedback lab at the Mayo Clinic. And so he said, Patrick, you know, you're an unusual guy. Would you mind coming in and letting me look at your brain waves? <laughs> and just to see if they're any different than like, you know, other people. And I said, sure, that'd be fun. So uh, he measured my, my uh, EEG signals. And I had, a, I had extremely high delta uh, waves with my eyes wide open. It's almost uh, so high that it was uh, uh, driving the machine off scale. And I had uh, theta and alpha signals simultaneously with these bursts of delta. And he told me that that's exactly what Swami Rama has in, in his head, same kind of signal. So he said, you look very much, you know, your, your brain signals are very much like his. And, um, and he had me do some calculus uh, mathematical problems. And I did the problems and still produced these signals. They should have gone away because I should have gone up into uh, beta. 
uh, range, but stay down in the alpha range and with these bursts of delta. And um, so at the time, I, I th just thought, well, maybe that's just it. I'm a weird kid and I have different brain waves. But later on, uh, I was involved in, in working with a device called the um, Neural Efficiency Analyzer, or NEA. And the NEA is a device that tests IQ by, by testing brain efficiency. And what it does is, it, is you have a strobe light that flashes a light, and, and each of our eyes pick up the light, and then it detects evoked potential in the uh, visual cortex. And it turns out that, that if, if you, a strobe light uh, is flashed in your eyes, the signals, uh, left and right signals, will arrive at the visual cortex with a time delay. And it turns out that the shorter the time delay, that is the, the, the closer together those signals arrive at the visual cortex, the higher a person's IQ. And they used the neural efficiency analyzer at, um, at um, West Point to, um, for officers' candidate uh, school uh, elimination to, to, because IQ, regular written IQ tests are pretty much slanted towards uh, uh, what neighborhood you grew up in, and, uh, and, and there are a lot of very sharp people who, who can't pass a written IQ test but are ex extremely intelligent and have very e efficient brains. And what we discovered uh, in working with the neural efficiency analyzer was that when a person used the neurophone for about half an hour, that the left and right hemispheres of the brain became perfectly coherent, and that the time delay between the left and right hemispheres uh, was zero, and, and the IQ was theoretically infinite uh, in that person, at least at that moment, after using the neurophone for half an hour. And so I began to think that um, maybe my brainwave um, my EEG signals that Dr. Farian tested were the result of using the neurophone. Uh, because by the time I was 17, I had used the neurophone virtually every day for four years. And, uh, and maybe that was what was doing it. And so we move up to present time. Uh, I've developed the neurophone gradually over the years. Um, and and I put out some neurophones back in 1997 that, uh, that were not very well made. We had a manufacturer in, um, in Phoenix that was uh, the first manufacturer, and they, the parts they chose were, were, I guess, the cheapest parts they could find. And uh, they charged me an, uh, a lot of money for them, but uh, the first batch of neurophones we ever put out had a 30% failure rate, which was... Uh, like a real loss, and, uh, and we had to replace all of those. But over the years now, we've developed uh, the neurophone to the point where uh, we now have military, uh, we have uh, neurophones built to military specs. Uh, we have two neurophones. Uh, the website, by the way, is uh, neurophone.com, uh, and you can see pictures of the neurophone and, and also pictures of the various ones I've made uh, in the history of the neurophone. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pretty good website. So it's N-E-U-R-O-P-H-O-N-E dot -E com. So uh, we happened to uh, send some neurophones. We made a, what's called a placebo neurophone. And it sounds like a neurophone, except that it doesn't have the 40 kilohertz carrier. It's just, just audio, and it's white noise. Uh, and, and we sent... Uh, a medical group in Nevada, a placebo neurophone and a regular neurophone to uh, test, and they were testing it on their uh, various um, stroke patients and, and other patients. And they discovered uh, using double blind crossover study, using the placebo and the regular neurophone, that uh, stroke patients recover eight times faster using the neurophone than they do without the neurophone or with the placebo. And um, they also found out that, that uh, when you use the neurophone 15 minutes to a half an hour a day, just listening to, to uh, pink noise 
or something new, we've come up with Fibonacci noise, but it even works with pink noise, that the neurophone also reduces cortisol levels or stress hormone levels in the body. So it's a great stress reduction machine. And then the head of this institute um, is a lady who has been doing uh, meditation for about 40 years, and she uses a 28 lead EEG every time she meditates to record the depth uh, that she goes in her meditation. And it's interesting because uh, she said that after using the Neurophone for about six weeks that she was producing uh, uh, signals that were identical to, to yogis who have meditated in caves for 40 years. And, uh, and she said, that's pretty deep. <laughs> so, uh, so she then tried it on uh, stealth bomber pilots. They have a couple of patients in there that are stealth bomber pilots and uh, suffering from stress just from flying those, those bombers and whatever. Um, anyway, but uh, they, she said that, that um, universally that they say that it increases their energy, their mental energy, makes them feel better, reduces their stress, and, uh, and I'm hoping raises consciousness a little bit. Um, maybe it'd be nice if they became Zen Buddhist meditators. Um, um, I know that uh, uh, the, the, anyway, uh, the Neurophone uh, apparently is, is a very good meditation device. In fact, not apparently, it is. And so this is the direction we're going. Um, now, in 1997, first of all, when I for invented the Neurophone, oh, by the way, Hugo Gernsback wrote me a letter. <laughs> he, uh, after I got all this publicity, Hugo Gernsback was in his 90s, and he wrote me a letter, and he thanked me for inventing the final device in his book, the only other thing that he predicted that had never been invented, and uh, which was uh, quite a treasure to receive from him. Um, but going, going forward, we didn't understand how the neurophone worked. At first, we thought it was working, uh, that the brain was somehow a radio receiver for 40 kilohertz signals. And uh, Dr. Martin Leonard at the uh, University of Georgia, yeah, yeah, Dr. Martin Leonard, University of Georgia, uh, published an article in a medical journal, and it was quite profound because he, he literally reduplicated my neurophone only, only instead of using um, um, Mylar electrodes in high voltage, he used a very efficient ultrasonic transducer, one that cost about $10,000, and he built a, a modulator uh, that was capable of, of uh, either uh, regular amplitude modulation or double sideband suppressed carry or upper or lower sideband and so forth. And he discovered that uh, Profoundly deaf people, people who were 100% deaf uh, through uh, damage to the nerves, as long as they could balance, now I'll, I'll explain why this is so, as long as, as long as that person could balance on one foot for, um, for a certain period of time with their eyes closed, they could hear with the neurophone uh, even though they were profoundly deaf and could not be helped but only if the ultrasonic power level was about 85 decibels, and, uh, which is actually a pretty high level at the skull. And uh, so, <clears throat> and the only deaf people who could not hear with the neurophone were people who could not balance on, on one foot with their eyes closed for a certain length of time. It's hard for anyone to do that, but the whole thing is, um, this was the test he used, and now I'll explain why. Dr. Leonard discovered the mechanism by which we receive signals by the neurophone. And there is a small organ in the inner ear called the saccule. And the saccule is about uh, the size of a pea, and it's, it's uh, got liquid in it, and it's got little grains of sand and nerves all over the inside of it. And it's used to detect the position of the head in relation to, to gravity. 
uh, so that we know whether we're right side up, upside down, or, or sitting at an angle, or whatever. And uh, so it's an organ of balance. And it turns out that the saccule in reptiles and in also in whales and dolphins uh, happens to be a hearing organ. And, and that it is a hearing organ that receives ultrasonic frequencies, but only if they're transmitted physically through the body. In other words, ultrasound coming through the air doesn't affect the saccule, but if it's transmitted physically through the body, the saccule becomes a hearing organ. And it's got nerves running all over the brain uh, that have nothing to do with balance. It's got nerves running to the hearing part of the brain and, and various other parts. And in fact, it's impossible to trace all the nerves running from the saccule to the different parts of the brain. So it's a very significant organ. Now, uh, I was all excited about it, and I was surprised that Dr. Uh, Leonard didn't mention the neurophone in his, in his article. So I called him up, and I said, Dr. Leonard, this is, uh, my name is Patrick Flanagan. And he said, oh, the inventor of the neurophone. And I said, yes. And he said, well, you know, he said, your idea, your neurophone is what made me build this device. And he said, and, uh, and, and I said, well, gee, why didn't you just give me credit? <laughs> you know, why didn't you mention my name at the end of the article or something? You know, thanks to Patrick Flanagan for doing this thing. And uh, he said, well, you never published the neurophone in a medical journal, and I figured I didn't have to quote you because it was unpublished, and even though it was published in other journals. But anyway, um, so... This, I, I started thinking about this. How can the human body, because it's a, it's a hearing organ that we have that we don't use, how could the human body receive ultrasonic sound physically through the body itself? There's only one way in nature that that could happen, and that would be if we were in the ocean and a whale or a dolphin was, was scanning us with their ultrasonic sound frequencies. Then, uh, you know, if you've ever swam with, uh, with whales, you know that when they emit ultrasonic sound bursts, you can hear it, and most of us think we're hearing it with our ears, but you're actually hearing it through your saccule. And, um, and so there was a study done with uh, autistic children, uh, and they found out that if autistic children swim with dolphins or they go in water with dolphins, the dolphins scan the children with their sonar, and the children get better when they test their brain waves. They actually uh, are uh, improved. And so they, they then took these uh, autistic children and they put them in an anechoic chamber with uh, ultrasonic loudspeakers and played this, the dolphin whistles to them. It didn't have any effect on their brain waves. The same people took the neurophone and tested the neurophone with the same signals, and it had the same effect as dolphins scanning uh, the children in water. And so um, this started, uh, I started thinking about this and saying, well, maybe we are somehow related to whales and dolphins in the distant past because there are theories that we once were water creatures, uh, amphibious, that we went in and out of water easily and, and, and we have all the characteristics of that. And so uh, we, we built an ultrasonic downverter, which is a... a, a, a ultrasonic microphone that takes ultrasonic sound and then converts it down into the range of ordinary human hearing. And then we put the neurophone on, on our head and, and then we walked around with the downverter to see what kind of signal came off the human head uh, when we were listening to the neurophone. And we found out that the... Um, that the front of the forehead emits signals, uh, ultrasonic signals, in a very tight beam, just like uh, an ultrasonic magnifier or just like an ultrasonic lens. And, and it has side lobes. In fact, it looks a little bit like the signal off a YAG antenna, uh, an electromagnetic signal. So, so when you put the neurophone on, you're transmitting this, this powerful ultrasonic signal off the front of your head. And this might explain some of the telepathic stuff that we've experienced with the neurophone. And um, so I thought about this, and I thought, well, boy, I wonder, uh, since we can record 
and, and hear ultrasonic sound through the body and our foreheads, sinuses, sinus cavities, our ultrasonic radiators, uh, maybe we can figure out a way to, to create ultrasonic sound using a human voice box. And so I began working on that and I discovered several ways of creating ultrasonic sound using, uh, using our, our own voice. And it's interesting that there are, are different ways of doing it. Uh, that's one, one way. Um, you, can, you can do it at higher frequencies. You go, uh, well, here, let's, let's try something. Uh, one, one way for, for you to experience the vibration of your forehead is, uh, is you plug up each nostril with a thumb and you put your, your fingers on your forehead like this and you push up with your fingers and you go, oh. You can feel your forehead vibrating quite powerfully. In fact, it's a really good vibrator. And so if you can direct uh, sounds from your throat, pulse, vocal pulses or other sounds, up into your sinuses, they vibrate and, and generate ultrasonic overtones. And um, so I taught some friends how to do this and, and they were moving, they were going to Hawaii and uh, they wanted to swim with dolphins and so they went to this bay where, uh, where dolphins uh, sometimes come and there were no dolphins and, and I had taught them how to make the ultrasonic sound. So I said, well, next time you go in the water, uh, I want you to go underwater and generate the ultrasonic tone and I want you to move your head back and forth, underwater, back and forth slowly, like you're scanning and just transmit that, that sound off, the, off your forehead into the water and see what happens. So, they went in the bay and, and there were no dolphins around. They were very disappointed. They went underwater. They did the exercise. Fifteen minutes later, they had 400 dolphins around them. <laughs> and, and these dolphins were scanning them intensely with their sonar to the point where their bodies were vibrating to the point they could hardly stand it. It was so strong. And, and they said, why do you think the dolphins did that? And I said, well, dolphins and whales have been saying, God, you guys are our ancient ancestors and you don't remember and someday you're going to remember how to make ultrasonic sound and you're going to come communicate. And so, because they can tell a, a mechanical ultrasonic oscillator or electronic one from an organic one. And, and when they heard that organic uh, beam coming through the water, they knew that was a human making that sound and that he had to be doing it consciously because otherwise, uh, you know, because they, we've been swimming with dolphins for a long time and, and uh, they know whether, you know, whether or not we can make this sound. So I said, next time they come to see you, just, just uh, communicate with them, just send a, a beam at them. And, and, and when you do, think the thought, how are you? You know, like, uh, yes, that was me, or, and, and how are you? Just think the thought. It doesn't matter what the sound is, it's just a carrier. And, um, and so I said, and then listen to the dolphin when they scan you, just see if you get any like weird thoughts or things, <laughs> you know, and it might be something they're transmitting. You know, they might go, yes, we heard you, we are here. <laughs> and, and just kind of realize that, that the human voice uh, carries certain kinds of information, but the intention when we're speaking is what really is, is carried on top of that. And I believe that intention is the most powerful communications device that we've got. And our ability to transmit intention with our words is most important because you can tell someone I love you and, and, um, and, and if your intention isn't there, then they know that that, that wasn't genuine and uh, because the intention is what really communicates. So, so at this point, uh, my research is, is leading toward uh, improving human consciousness with the neurophone. And a while back, uh, how many of you have, uh, know of Dan Winters? 
Okay, Dan Winters is, is this guy who is a sacred geometer and he's really good at it and he has a, a website, um, it's called soulinvitation.com, S-O-U-L, soulinvitation.com. And uh, he developed with some scientists a device called a heart tuner. Now the heart tuner is quite profound device because uh, it has these electrodes you put on your wrist and it picks up a EEG signal from your heart and then it does a mathematical transformations of the heartbeat in order to analyze the frequencies that make up the heartbeat and what it does is it, it does a fast Fourier transform of the heartbeat so you, you see the individual sine wave frequencies that make up uh, that waveform and then it does a second Fourier transform to get what's called a septum and the septum gives you the mathematical ratios of the overtones of the heartbeat to each other. And so one of the things that, that they've discovered is that if a person is angry, the harmonic overtones of the heartbeat are extremely discordant and mathematically discordant. And if you are in a state of love, if you're, if you, if you're able to go into a, a feeling just a feeling of unconditional love, which we can all do. We think about something that, that or someone that we love, and, and if we think about them for a few minutes, we go into this love space. And so they discovered that when a person goes into a, a state of love, that the harmonic overtones of the heartbeat are, are related to the golden ratio. And that... Uh, the golden ratio is the frequency of love. And um, so we did an experiment at my house many, many years ago with one of the earlier models of this device. I have several of them uh, that I uh, do research with. But one of the things is, is that um, uh, my wife Stephanie was on a, um, a, a, a tether. She, she had a, a wire and, and she was hooked up to, to a device. Uh, and was on one channel on the computer and I was hooked up on another channel and she was about a hundred feet away from me. And so uh, I went into a state where I was feeling unconditional love and, and my heartbeat put out a perfect golden ratio harmonics and the waveform is perfectly coherent. And, um, and then all I did was think of Stephanie. All I did was put my attention, attention on her and as I placed my attention on her with my mind, her heartbeat went into perfect golden ratio harmonics. And this has been done over great distances, distances of miles and miles and miles, and uh, uh, tens, tens of thousands of miles actually over the internet, and it works. And so you, you wonder why uh, there's a saying, love thy enemy, uh, maybe, Maybe if someone hates you, you can just send them love and, and, uh, or they don't like you or something. And you can send them love instead of hatred because uh, if you go into a state of love and you think about them, then that puts them into a state of, of love also at least for a few moments and maybe it will improve your relationship. Um, at any rate, um, this gave me the idea of creating what's called a Fibonacci neurophone. And... And what we did is we took uh, the algorithm for, for white noise, for pink noise, and the, the neurophones, by the way, are, uh, have 20 megahertz crystals uh, that determine uh, all the frequencies used in the neurophone, including the carrier frequency. And they're extremely precise. And like I say, they use military grade parts. Um, and uh, the neurophone DSP is, is uh, engraved um, uh, hardened aluminum anodized case and we have another one called the GRS and but anyway uh, the golden ratio was is so important to me in my work that that we figured out a way to create what's called golden ratio noise and what we do is we, we create um, uh, a noise generator and we feed it with very very high levels of Fibonacci numbers uh, prime, prime Fibonacci numbers at very, very high levels and, and it generates what sounds like uh, white noise or pink noise, but every single frequency of the pink noise is related to every other frequency by a logarithm 
base to the golden ratio. And so that is my preferred, uh, preferred neurophone. So I have this little GRS neurophone that I use, and um, I have one with me, which I can, I can show you at some point, um, I guess after the lecture. I, I, my time's getting really close here. Um, and so um, when you listen to it uh, for about, uh, I listen to it for about half an hour a day. Sometimes I sleep with it all night long. And, uh, and I have the wildest, most incredible dreams. Um, but uh, one of the things we learned is that you don't have to play content through the neurophone to learn with it also. Uh, now, uh, Stephanie's daughter, uh, when I met her, was 15 years old, and she was making uh, C's and D's in school, and she was ADD, and she had a very hard time reading. And when she'd read, she'd say, I, I, I'd read, uh, start reading an assignment, and I'd get to the bottom of the page and forget what I read at the top and have to go back and read it over again. So I said, just put the neurophone on, turn the signal down low, and just uh, read with the neurophone on and see if it helps you. And so she did that, and her grades jumped within one month her, to straight A's. And she remembered everything that she could read and uh, used the neurophone in all her studies. She just graduated from UC University of California, Santa Cruz, as a, a media film major and, uh, and uh, A plus student. So um, it, it does work, and it's profound. And, and the, uh, someday, maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Leonard will make a neurophone device for deaf people with the 85 dB uh, output. Right now, our neurophones uh, are consciousness, experimental consciousness improvement devices. And I'm hoping that maybe we can make a scalar wave Fibonacci signal generator that will transmit uh, love frequencies uh, throughout large areas, uh, even very large cities, <laughs> and maybe countries, and uh, maybe put people in a state of love instead of anger. And uh, so I call that the anti-harp device, and that's uh, one of the... <laughs> one of the devices that, uh, that we're working on in our future research. So uh, I have uh, three websites you might want to uh, check out. Uh, one is, of course, neurophone.com. The other one is Phi Sciences, spelled P-H-I Sciences, S-C-I-E-N. CES.com, and the third one, I mean, and, and the last one is wetterwater.com, and you can see some of the other research and developments and things that we've created. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you.